Virtual infidelity or cyber sex is taking on an incredible, enormous, staggering um, statistics as far as its growth. It was growing along anyway, but I think during the pandemic, it has gotten worse and almost every therapist is now working with couples who were married and who are dealing with it in their marriage. The thing about any kind of virtual infidelity is the lies are so rampant, so easy, that once again, it's the lies that end up destroying the marriage. I read a statistic that an estimated 20 to 33% of all internet users go online for sexual purposes. Most are male the age of 35 years old, married with children and well-educated. As many as 17% of users become addicted to the online sexual activity. Now I've talked to you in another uh, video about how affairs are a form of addiction, how they take that on and they replicate the same pattern. So the actual other person, the person you're having the affair with becomes your vice. And so basically you need that vice. Okay, so there's many reasons that this type of behavior starts happening. The first of it is it's extremely accessible. Secondly, it's very affordable. And lastly, the ability to hide one's identity helps people feel that they can escape their partner without getting cost, caught. In other words, they can have their cake and eat it too, but we all know what ends up happening is because it's got an addictive component, it ends up taking not only you down, but everything you love as well, because it can't sustain itself, because a relationship based on lies is never going to work. And the one thing we know about lies is eventually the truth is found. So how does this behavior chat and I th start? And I think what's so important for couples to understand is this isn't immediate. Like it starts, and I always say to myself, it starts, surely somebody saw one of the partners, either the person in the affair or the partner started seeing the change. But I think by the time, because of couples being so busy and so preoccupied with kids, with work, with other things, they aren't watching their partner and their partner gets to a point where they're terrified to share anything with their partner. There's so much distance. But what it, what usually begins is you start online chatting with another person. You begin emailing. You do it out of boredom or maybe just because you're unhappy at home. You're having stress. Whatever the reason, it starts the cycle. And then behaviors that were once off limits face to face, like you know you shouldn't need another person for lunch. You have no problem doing that online because there's the safety of the computer or the phone and you tell yourself because of that, that it's not real. There's a denial component in it. And then basically individuals seeking to connect to the potential partner, well, they're starting to present themselves in a way that is not real. Like they can say anything they want, right? They can be whatever they want. They can make up an ideal career. They can talk about how they look. They can talk about how they dress, whatever. I mean, basically they are creating their own avatar, if you will, especially if they're thinking, well, you know, I'd have like six months to a year to meet up with this person. Like if they're not in shape by then I'll be in shape. And they might even start a gym membership to fulfill what they're telling this person that they look like, or they do for a career. They're scrambling to find out what what they told this person that they actually do so they can research it and use the lingo. I have seen incredible things. There's a lot of work that dip, that partners will put up to try and create a false front when they're in one of these virtual infidelity affairs. Um, so you can see what may have started somewhat innocently, like they were bored or they were still a choice, but I mean, it wasn't ever thought of at that point to be something greater. It's taking on a whole new 
like motivation and momentum and you can see that. So what are the signs? You're going to feel a decrease of self-esteem because you're going to get needier on this other person. And because it's an addictive format, when you're not with them, you're extremely anxious. You're always anxious. You're anxious somebody's going to find out. You're anxious you might lose them. You're anxious about what you're doing, especially if you have a pretty strong moral code, strong moral conscious. If you and your if you know that this is wrong, that you're violating your vows, if you feel strongly about that, you're going to have a whole new tension that you may have never felt before. You have a sense of isolation because you always got to hide this computer, right? And nobody else knows that you're doing this. It's two people. And that even though that secrecy keeps it going, it also is going to be the demise of you because the more isolated you get, this becomes your world and you lose touch with your kids, with your partner, with whatever else is going on. Many times you'll see people failing at work when they get so into this. They have a, basically some have a difficulty being aroused by their partner. They no longer feel the same way. So their partner's like, what's the matter with you? Like we used to have sex once a week. Now we don't have it all at all. And then on the other side, there are people who start demanding these you know, outrageous sexual acts because what they're seeing virtually with this with this other person that they like is this person will do anything. And if your partner is maybe more shy or embarrassed about sexual acts, they're going to think you're going through some kind of a crisis. Like, why now? Why do you want to bring a third person in now when we've never done that in the past? The partner watching may see a significant change, but at this point, the partner's always home. They don't really know what else to blame it on. Like, they're like, well, they're not going anywhere. And many people just don't think of the phone or internet, a, a virtual person as being real, but make no mistake, virtual affairs are rampant and they're every bit as potent as a real person that you're seeing day to day or you're running away to see. And eventually they can even get to that. So the partner starts getting a little insecure at this point. They start making... Um, they start feeling less trust. They're checking more. They're, there's something going on. They're getting further and further away from their spouse. And they may be giving more attention to the kids. They may be alerting the kids that something's going on. Whatever it is, they, they have an inkling, but they still don't have a clue what it is. If The most important thing that you understand at this point is you don't have to allow this to screw up your marriage. At this point, there is still still things that you can do that are going to make a difference. And the first thing I'm gonna encourage you to do, and perhaps the hardest, is to confront your spouse, the person who is cheating. Now, when you confront them and you tell them you know something's going on, they may confess. They may confess right then, they may feel so guilty, they may beg your forgiveness. They may ask you what they can do. And if they take that tactic, that's a wonderful time at that point to seek therapy right away. Well, we're going to need to go to therapy. I don't know what I need. Um, let's do that. If you're okay with that, if you're feeling like this is something you guys can work through. Other times, the partner's going to experience a situation that they they see that as a betrayal because they see the cheating partner no less they will twist their mind to see that your invasion in their privacy was a betrayal and they may make a big fuss and they may say you had no right in other words they won't come right out and tell you what happened but they will make you they will persecute you and make you feel badly that you looked into their stuff and they'll use that word betrayal. Mostly that's a projection from what they're doing, but just know if you know it and you can kind of expect it, then you can know what your stance is. Sometimes when the partner comes clean, the other partner is so upset that they're like, I hate you, I despise you, I can't imagine being with you, 
what I caution you at this point, take a break. Give yourselves two weeks to live apart and calm down before you go any further. And the reason is because when this news comes out, neither one of you are going to be rational. And it's very important that you cool down before you decide what you're going to do, because it's easy to say, I want you out of my life, divorce, divorce. But I'm telling you now, I have seen a lot of problems when couples divorce over with this reaction. And the reason is because it's too fast. It's too fast and it's not gonna be good for you and it's not gonna be good for the kids. And ultimately the person that's cheating, it's not going to be in their favor either. So as much as you can, try to preserve a line where the two of you decide to take a break. Sometimes after confrontation, the person who is the cheater is so anxious and so scared and so addicted to this virtual companion that what they will end up doing is they will they will say, I want out of the marriage and they will they will just feel like they're the ones that are gonna cut the marriage off. Once again, if that happens, then what you need to do as the person being betrayed by a cheater, you need to get a lawyer and you need to get a counselor, but you do not want to file any papers at this point until you're advised by a therapist and a lawyer because this is often a reaction to severe guilt, to severe um, fear, anxiety, it, and it's an, it's an addict's response. So you have to be the one who understands, I protect myself, I protect my kids. And the way I do that, I get a therapist, I get a lawyer, and I say as little as possible at this point till I've had counsel from both of them. Your partner will use all kinds of lies. They lived on lies, basically, and you have to expect those. They'll lie about everything. They'll make you perhaps feel like you're overreacting no matter what you do. You know in your heart this is a form of an addiction. You know it's been going on for a while. If you listen to your gut, more than likely, you have the truth. It's just that you have to hold on until you're in a stable place, not confused, not hurt, not angry, not broken to make a decision that's going to affect you the rest of your life. And that's exactly what I'm trying to help and encourage you to do. Seeking help. This is the most important thing. If both people are invested in the marriage and two thirds of my clients who this happens to are, then I recommend you each go to a therapist, make everything transparent, no matter how difficult, get rid of computers, get rid of phones, get rid of any way that you contacted this person. Wipe this person out of your mouth, out of your life. Start thinking about how you can begin restoring the marriage and you can restore it. These little tips are probably what a therapist is going to recommend, but the therapist is also going to help process because you need the processing. You need the, the grieving. You need all of it in order to move past it, forgive, and learn to trust again. First of all, use pictures of your spouse, family, or other important person as screensavers on a computer in a central area of your house so that everybody can see the same computer and you're reminded what you're attached to, who your family is, because you've lost sight of that if you're the cheater. Secondly, as I said, the computer is in a central place. Phones are on that same table. All passwords are shared on the phone. Anybody can look at anybody's phone. No hidden accounts. Everything is transparent. And you have a time in the morning when the phone goes on and a time at night when the phone goes off. 
use the computer only at designated times. Like if you're working, if you're playing a game with your spouse or your kids at night, the computer is for work and family time, nothing more. It's not for your entertainment anymore. You have to do that. If you're serious about making this relationship work again, then you're gonna to have to make sacrifices and that's one of them. Um, control the internet access with filtering or blocking software or use an internet service provider that already filters its internet content. You can also monitor software with email reports of visited sites to your spouse so that your everybody is on the same page. The more transparent you are, it's not a punishment to you. It's actually putting in boundaries you needed before to preserve your relationship and keep it sacred. And lastly, make sure you have a good therapist and make sure that your investment in therapy with your time, with you doing the homework, and with no matter how frequently you have to go, is not ever begrudged for something else because therapy here is the answer. It's a difference in being able to live in a healthy relationship and co-create it to be healthier and closer going forward or not. And you deserve it to yourself and to your children and to each other to continue if you're going to be in a relationship, a healthy one that you both enjoy being a part of.